Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. That was good. It is morning, isn't it? Good morning. Good morning. That's better. Good hearing, hearing from you this morning. I thought there would be where everybody's still asleep. Oh, my goodness. Anyways, we're going to start this morning off as we hear, ask the Lord to hear our praises. So let's stand as we sing. Hear our praises. Thank you. 
Well, good morning, everybody, and welcome to worship at Chameleon Baptist Church. It is a joy to be here with you today, and we want to welcome everyone, members and guests alike, but in particular for you members. We just have one favor to ask of you. We have a little guest card in the back of the pews. If you could take those and fill those out, and we have offering plates uh, over here on either side that you can drop that in, or you can leave that with one of the greeters. Um, but that's just an easy way for us to be able to get back in touch with you let you know how grateful we are for you being here with us and also to answer any questions that you might have. So we've got a number of announcements to get through this morning. Um, one, Operation Christmas Child. Uh, we have, uh, we're in the midst of that right now. November 8th is going to be our big packing party that we always have. That will be Sunday night on November 8th. And if you did not get all of the details from the video, that you just watched about what's okay and what's not okay, you guys can speak with Tracy Autry and get that information. And so if you'd like to participate in Operation Christmas Child, really there's two ways. You can uh, be a part of the packing party by donating supplies, donating shoe boxes, coming to help pack, or you yourself as an individual or a family, y'all can pack a box yourself. And as they said on there, you can pay your shipping online and when that happens, they actually send you an email and you can see which country uh, your box was sent to. Again, any questions about any of that, please see Tracy Autry. I want to mention from the beginning as well um, that our sound, crew, our sound and media crew, um, we have installed just on Thursday of this week a new soundboard. And this is a massive upgrade going from an, from an analog soundboard to a digital one. So we're mentioning that, just asking you guys uh, to be patient and to bear with our sound and media team, uh, not just today, but especially over these next few weeks as they're learning an all new system. And really this is the first step in upgrading to where we can be able to, to televise all of this online in a very professional way. So this is the beginnings of something. So you guys bear with us. Uh, throughout this whole process and we're grateful for our sound and media team and everything they do for us in the background. All right, something we are beginning back once again uh, that we lost from all, the, our, all of our COVID measures, but we're beginning again this morning, Children's Church. Now it's gonna be a little different from how we've done it in the past. Children's Church will now just be for those first through third grade. And as you may have already noticed, you're gonna be in the service a little longer than you used to. Um, now you'll be in the service the whole time up until I get ready to preach. And so once the special music is done and I'm coming up on stage, not just today, but all the mornings that we have children's church, that will be the time that children first through third grade to leave. And to be honest, I completely forgot to ask Janet where the children are supposed to go, but. Wherever you go, you went in the past, Mike's pointing to the back. So apparently you go to the back. So wherever you're supposed to go, you go there. And uh, we'll figure that out. All right, tonight, beginning tonight at 5.30, we are beginning a new uh, Disciple Life class that I will be teaching called Building Marriages God's Way. This is for people who are married, for people who are single, for people who are dating, for whoever. Um, and so I encourage you guys to come and to be a part of that uh, as we look at what a biblical marriage looks like and uh, how to ensure that we have that. And so I've done this twice before, once in Georgia, once in Kentucky, and I've loved it. Those who have been a part of it have really benefited from, benefited from it as well. So I encourage you guys to be there. 530 will run to about 645 tonight. All right, lastly. Um, I, kind of our, our fall festival that we normally have on October 31st on Halloween. We're still going to have it, but it's going to look a little different this year. We can't have the big bonanza that we normally have to where we have a big outreach event and invite tons of people from the neighborhood because that's too many people for us to meet the state regulations. But we've decided that our children have lost too many things uh, to COVID. And so we are still going to have our fall festival, but it's going to be for our church kids, okay? It's not like we're going to have bouncers at the door turning people away if they don't, you know, if somebody shows up that doesn't come to church. But in light of the fact we do have measures, this isn't something that we're publicizing to the world. 
but it's going to be available for our church family from 4 o'clock to 5.30 on Saturday the 31st. A number of things we need from you as the church family. We need candy, we need chili, and we need desserts. And so if you can provide any of those, that would be wonderful. Also, we need workers to work stations and the different games and everything that we'll have for our children. And so and then lastly, we need children to show up. And we're doing it early enough so that you can come get candy here and then go trick-or-treating and get more candy. So it's a win for everybody. So we encourage y'all to be a part of that. If you want more information, please see Jenny. All right, that was a lot. Normally we don't have that much, but that was a lot. So you guys join me in prayer. Father, we thank you that we can gather today. And Lord, I thank you that there is a need for as many announcements that we have. Um, there are a lot of churches that still aren't even gathering. And some that are, but aren't really doing anything else. And so, Lord, I thank you uh, that we can continue to take these steps to getting back and functioning normally as a church. And Lord, just in particular today, as we gather, I know, I understand that there are tons of things going on in people's lives. And I pray that our hearts and our minds would be able to be focused on Christ. And out of the overflow of our hearts, that we would be able to worship you from a pure heart. And so, Lord, may you be glorified. May Christ be exalted above all others. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We're going to serve the Lord with gladness this morning. So let's stand as we sing. <laughs> Oh, 
thankful for your son Jesus who died for us Lord. Lord we just pray right now that you just take these tithes and offerings Lord and you just use them Lord to further your kingdom that we just reach out to this world around us Lord. We ask these things in your son's name. Amen. Oh, 
so much. Y'all can turn with me in your Bibles to 1 Peter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. And Miss Janet is in the back for any of you children who are leaving for children's church. So, as you're turning there in 1 Peter 1, 1 through 2, I want you to think through something with me. But what is typically your response when hardship hits? When difficulty, pain, or suffering begins to come our way, 
how do we normally respond? For many people, we respond with depression. It's where we go through an extended period of time to where we kind of begin to feel pity for ourselves. We look at our life and we get upset and feel sorry for ourselves for everything that we're going through. We begin to think things like, how can this be happening to me again? Out of all the people in the world, why me? You know, I don't know if I can really make it through this. And so we find ourselves depressed as we go through this stuff. Or maybe we respond to difficulty with fear and anxiety. We look at what we're going through and our minds automatically begin to scan all of the endless possibilities of how this hardship can turn out. And amazingly enough, every single one of those possibilities end in disaster, right? Especially if you're researching on Google and WebMD, right? Nothing ever turns out well when you go to places like that. And so as we, as our minds scan these endless possibilities, and we assume all of these disastrous outcomes to be true, we begin to live in fear of what we think lies before us. Or maybe we respond with anger. Anger at God. God, how could you let this happen to me? God, don't you know how faithful I've been? Haven't you seen all the things that I've been doing? I mean, for goodness sakes, I, I haven't missed a Sunday in four years. And look at how hard I have it. Look at how easy everybody else has it who's not trying as hard as I am. Or maybe you're mad at others for bringing the difficulty and pain into your life. Maybe you're just mad at the world. And at circumstances, your pains or, or your anger is not directed towards any certain person. You're just angry in general because of life. Or maybe when difficulty hits, do you just give up in a what's the use kind of mindset? You give up morality. You give up trying. You, you, you give up all discipline. For instance, you look at life and you say, What's the point? What's the point of even trying? I mentioned this two weeks ago in Psalm 73. Asaph, who wrote that psalm, did that. Looking at the difficulty in his life, he said, all of my faith has been in vain. My faith hasn't given me anything. And so we look at that and we say, what's the point? We just give up and we begin to fill our lives with other things. Maybe we turn to something like pornography. Say, ah, the temptation's too strong. I'm going to give in to it anyways. Why even fight the battle? Just go on and give in. Or maybe we give in because, well, I'm so miserable. At least here's a little bit of excitement. Or maybe something like overeating. We talked about that a few weeks ago, too. We think that that will bring us happiness and joy and comfort, but it never does, does it? Shopping, we just go out on that splurge, that spending spree. Just anything to bring joy to my life. Or maybe, tell me you haven't done this. You just give up and literally do nothing. Spend the entire day on the couch, watching TV, binging Netflix, all day. Folks, we've been there, haven't we? Some of us may be there today, right now. Some of you who are watching this online, maybe you're watching it online, because you're in that situation, and that's why you're not here at church right now. Jesus said in the book of John, in this world there will be trouble. And when that trouble comes, how do we respond? Difficulty hits, and so often, instead of responding like we should, we respond in these ways that I've just mentioned. Well, this morning, we're going to begin a study through the book of first Peter and it's going to take us a little while to get through it we're going to look at all five chapters of first Peter uh, chapter or passage by passage I should say and I'm really excited about this because first Peter is one of the most practical and applicable books there are Peter writes to a group of Christians who know firsthand what suffering and difficulty and pain and heartache taste like and he writes to them to encourage them 
to encourage them in their suffering and in their pain and their heartache, to give them a hope and joy and purpose to keep going. But he does something else that I find really, really interesting. Peter writes instructions and commands to them. So it's a book of encouragement, but he encourages them via instructions and commands. So therefore, the title of the sermon series is 1 Peter, Instructions and Encouragement and Hope. Now I mentioned that it's interesting that there's so many instructions in this book. Because typically when we think about encouraging people who are downcast, struggling, going through difficult times, we don't think about giving them commands. We just think about being there for them, right? Putting our arm around them, being there to hear them out, giving a listening ear to them. And certainly there is a time and a place for that. So when somebody's hurting, when somebody's struggling, they don't need you to come solving all of their problems. They just need somebody to weep with them. Which is why scripture calls us to weep with those who weep. And it's up to us to discern when we need to open our mouths and when we just need to shut it and weep with them. But at some point, we need more than that. And that's what Peter gives us here in this book of 1 Peter. Um, as he writes, again, this letter to encourage us. We need instruction. He writes a letter to encourage us, and it's a letter of encouragement that is chock full of commands. But one of the beautiful things about it is that before he ever gets to really about four chapters worth of commands, he spends just a little bit more than a chapter reminding us of the hope of the gospel and what the gospel means to our life and the benefit that the gospel brings to us. You see, at the heart of all of Peter's instructions, at the heart of all of those commands is a desire for Jesus to be exalted through our lives. For Jesus to be magnified through all of the pain and the suffering and the heartache and the hardships that we're going through. And what Peter wants us to know today is that regardless of what life brings our way, that we can bear witness to the grace of God in our lives. Regardless of what life brings our way, that we can bear witness to the grace of God in our lives. And isn't that what we as Christians really want anyways? When we get to the end of our lives and somebody else is preaching our funeral, for that testimony to be the testimony that is given by the family and by that preacher, Whatever he faced in life, whatever life threw her way, they bore witness to the grace of God and the immeasurable riches of Christ. Nothing stopped them from doing that. Or here's another way of putting it, another way of thinking about it maybe, is that our lives can never get too difficult for God to use us for his glory. Our lives can never get too difficult for God to use us for his glory. And so if you're there with me in 1 Peter, all we're going to look at today is just the first two verses, the introduction to this letter. 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 1 through 2. You can follow along with me as I read this. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who are elect exiles of the dispersion, in Pontius, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit, for obedience to Jesus Christ, and for sprinkling with his blood. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. So there's a lot of different things going on in these first two verses that we may look at and say, well, what in the world can we draw out of these two verses? How are you going to write a sermon about this? It's just an introduction. It's the author saying who's writing the letter and who he's writing it to. Well, guys, there's a ton in these first two verses here. And as we begin to look at the recipients, uh, who this letter uh, being written to is, Peter says that it's written to those who are elect exiles 
of the dispersion. And then he gives five provinces in the area in that time period known as Asia Minor, which would be the present day Turkey. Okay, and he lists five provinces here, Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. In reality, if you're a biblical uh, geography major, um, you might say, well, pastors, really, there were just four provinces. Yes, technically there were. One of the provinces was named Pontus and Bithynia. It was two regions that combined together to form one province, but regardless, Peter breaks them up because even though it's one province, it's two distinct different regions. So Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. And that Asia is not the continent of Asia that we know. Again, that was just a province there within Asia Minor or present-day Turkey. And he writes, in these five areas to exiles of the dispersion. Exiles of the dispersion. An exile is someone who has been sent away from their home. Not by a desire of their own, but they have been forced out to somewhere that is not their home. And so he's writing to people who are not accepted where they're living. They have been exiled from their homes. Now, many people believe that these were Christians of the Jewish dispersion. And if you may not know what the Jewish dispersion is, Emperor Nero in the mid-60s, around 65 or 66 AD, somewhere around there, began one of the greatest persecutions the world has ever seen outside of Nazi Germany. Emperor Nero hated Christians with a passion to the point that when he accidentally burnt down Rome, he devised it so that he blamed it on Christians for the world at that time assumed Christians in retaliation to him and his persecution burned down Rome. But that wasn't true. He just accidentally did it. All right. And so as Emperor Nero began this horrendous persecution of Christianity, Christians fled for their lives. Nero wanted to stomp out Christianity, but by the grace of God, that's exactly what Christianity needed to spread throughout the world. It went from right there where all the Christians were located, and as Nero drove them from their homes, guess what? They took the gospel with them, and the gospel spread like wildfire under persecution. But that dispersion, even though Peter uses the name dispersion, that's not the ones who Peter's writing to. Because Peter wrote this letter around 61 AD, which would have been three, four, five years before that Jewish dispersion under Nero began. So Peter's writing to a different people, not those. Though certainly persecution of the Jews was already taking place. We, we look at Jesus himself. Jesus himself was scourged and beaten and persecuted. We, we look at the apostles. All right, Peter's writing this from a jail cell in Rome, waiting for his head to be chopped off. Eleven of the twelve disciples were murdered. The only one who wasn't was John, who was sent out to exile just to live by himself in the wilderness. So certainly persecution was taking place, but it wasn't the big persecution we look at in history. So this wasn't written to the Jews, but this was written primarily to Gentiles, of which the gospel had already spread. These are written to Gentile Christians, pagans who used to worship foreign pagan gods, but had now turned to the one true God through the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It was those living in the five provinces of Asia Minor. And this is important to differentiate who this is written to for a reason. It's because these were written to people who were primarily still living in their homes. They had not been driven from their towns. They were still in their homelands, living in their own homes. So it's interesting that Peter would call them exiles. Because remember, exiles are people who had been driven from their own homes. And here are people who are still living there. So how could they be exiles if they're still living literally in their own homes? Chapter 4, verses 3 through 5 gives us insight into this. As they speak of Gentiles casting out the Christians. 
and ostracizing them and maligning them because the Christians no longer joined them in the sins of which they used to participate. You see, the Christians in that area, when they had become followers of Christ, they had turned away from their sins, they had left their life of sin, and the other people in that area cast them out of their social circles, cast them out of their friendships. Even many of them lost their marriages because they wanted nothing to do with people who had changed their life, were living a different life, and would no longer partake of those sins. Peter tells of suffering under the hands of wicked masters and government, Christians who were Christian slaves who were being beaten by their wicked masters, government who was intentionally ruling against Christians. They tell of split marriages to where one spouse converted and the other didn't. And it was causing marriages to break up and tension within the home. They tell of the Christians being falsely slandered because of their faith and even of the struggles and disunity within churches to which he was writing. Yes, these Christians were still in their homes. Yes, they were still in their homelands, but really even within their own cities, they were strangers, aliens, exiles, and outcasts. They were not wanted even by their own families, by their friends, or by their neighbors. They were strangers, aliens, exiles within their own homes. Which as we look at that, is really the essence of being a Christian. We are told in scripture that this is not our home. We're just passing through. All right, and, and listen, I love the United States. It's the greatest country ever on the face of the earth. And because of the liberties that have been given to the United States from our founding fathers and all of the veterans who have served to keep that and everyone else responsible, because of that, the gospel has been able to spread throughout the world as a result of the United States greater than at any time at any point in history. So listen, I don't want you to hear me as sounding unpatriotic, okay? But our allegiance is not to the United States. If the United States no longer becomes a nation, literally nothing changes for us. Because our allegiance is not to America. It's to Christ. As we look to our eternal home, as Paul tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, that this tent that we live in, that even if we lose this tent that we live in, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that's what we long for. And so in a sense, all Christians are exiles. We don't belong. And listen, we are beginning to see that more and more and more, even here in America, the great country I was just talking about. Just go study up on what John MacArthur is dealing with. And the churches in Nevada and many other places. Things are changing and changing quickly. And so we need this book. We need it to be encouraged and to learn and to have these instructions that Peter gave us. Now, there is direct teaching here, all right? Christian persecution. Uh, as he talks about exiles and Christians, again, who are being persecuted, there's direct teaching because Christian persecution is taking place throughout the world. All right, it, things are getting worse for Christians here. And yes, even without persecution, there's suffering, just general suffering that all of us go through. But there are many Christians throughout the world who are directly being persecuted. In fact, I just read before walking into the sanctuary about Christians who are being held in the country of Eritrea, which is in Northern Africa, one of the most dangerous places to live in the world, who are being jailed and put into prison. That's known as kind of the North Korea of Africa. That there are places in that Middle East, North African region to where it is extremely dangerous to be Christian to the point, most of those are Muslim communities. 
If someone in your family converts to Christianity, here's what the law of the land is. The patriarch of that family has to drag that family member who just converted to Christianity, has to drag them out to the public square and murder them in front of everybody. Doesn't matter if it's your spouse, your parent, your mother, your child. And if you don't do it, guess what? The government kills you for not being willing to do what the law required. There are some missions videos that at some point in time we'll get around to watching here. Dispatches on the front of Tim Kazee. Tim Kazee travels around to these difficult places and he was interviewing a man who had become a Christian in, in one of these areas. And he said the night he became a Christian, he went ahead and sent a text message out to everybody on his contact list to let them know because he assumed when he laid his head down in bed that night that he would wake up in heaven because his father would murder him in his sleep. There are Christians around the world that deal with that. It makes things here in America not seem so bad, right? And so there are many places that the book of 1 Peter is immediately and directly applicable. But even here in America, there's still a sense of suffering for Christ. Even though, praise the Lord, we're not dealing with all of that. There is a call for each and every Christian to give up, to sacrifice, to die to self to that old life. We give up the luxury that the rest of the world lives in. We spend our money on things that will last not on things that moth and rust will destroy. We understand that there are more important things in life than stuff and possessions. We give up the American dream of the grandiose retirement lifestyle for the Christian dream of service and faithfulness to a church. We reject the sin that the world's participating in that on the surface seems fun. On the surface, it seems to bring great joy and happiness, but we ultimately know is displeasing to God and brings pain to us as well. We can be ostracized at school, middle schoolers, you high schoolers, even those in elementary school. Those deciding to make the right choice and not follow the same pattern that everyone else is living in, rejected, maligned, because we've chosen to live differently. There's a lot of Christian students, even in elementary school, that just don't fit in. And listen, that's okay. <laughs> we probably don't want to fit in at school anyways, to be honest. It's okay. We're maligned, We're chosen to live differently. For adults, our parenting methods, our marriage principles that we live by. Just think about Mike Pence a few years ago. All right. Big story on Mike Pence shortly after he and Trump took office. Word came out through the media that Mike Pence would never have a meal with the lady who was not his wife. Because he was never going to put himself in a position to be tempted. He was going to protect his marriage. And what happened? He was lambasted by the media. Drugged through the coals or wanting to protect his marriage. Guess what was going on at the time? The Me Too movement. That was in the middle of the Me Too movement about men mistreating women. And here's Mike Pence wanting to protect the purity of his marriage and protect the relationship with his wife. Completely mocked nationwide. We don't fit in. We don't fit in. And so, yes, we're not having our heads chopped off, praise the Lord. But there is still a price that we pay. Again, even beginning all the way back in elementary school. And Peter says here that they were more than exiles. As he writes to them, to the elect exiles of the dispersion. To the elect exiles of the dispersion. And now please, I know in Southern Baptist churches, we see words like predestination and elect because they're all through the New Testament. And we get worried, oh no, what's going on here? Listen, don't get caught up in all of that predestination free will stuff. That is not what Peter's talking about here. So don't get sidetracked onto that stuff. All right? 
What Peter's saying is that these people might have been disenfranchised, discriminated against, and mistreated. But they are God's people. They have been rejected by others, but chosen by God. He saved them, knowing the ramifications of that decision. He called them to Christ, called them to follow him, and saved them, knowing the rejection and the mocking and the ridicule and the persecution that that would bring their way. But he chose them and called them their own anyways. Peter, he begins this letter by saying, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Later in chapter 5, Peter says to them that he is writing them from Babylon. Now this is interesting because Babylon didn't exist anymore. What Peter means here, he was writing from Rome. Babylon was the nation, one of the most wicked nations who's ever lived. Horrible, wicked nations. They, the, the rumors about how bad of a people they were were so strong. This is how they would win all their wars. They wouldn't fight them. They would just go into an area and say, hey, did you hear what we did to these last guys? You need to surrender us right now or it's going to be worse for you than it was for them. And all the nations would just cower in fear before him. Well, Judah had been living unrighteously for a long time and God had been warning them, sending prophets into them, and they didn't listen. So eventually, God sent Babylon into Judah. And over the course of about 15 years, Three different times, Babylon came in and took Judah into exile for about 70 years. And so Babylon was known as the tormentors of God's people. Remember, Peter is in jail in Rome. He's writing these people from the modern day Babylon. From the new people that were tormentors of God's people. Peter is in exile in Rome, writing to exiles in other places. He was in a society in Rome that was in the birth pains of the massive persecution against Christianity. A city that once that rebellion hit would be the city in which his head would eventually be removed from him by the wicked anti-Christian government. So Peter is writing to exiles as a suffering exile himself. Listen, I'm going through this too. I'm walking through this with you. So this that I'm writing to you, this is not just some high platitudes. This is something that I'm living and that I'm applying to myself. And as Peter begins, he says, to those who are elect to exiles of the dispersion, according, this is verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. And he begins his next section speaking of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. In fact, this is a great explanation of the Trinity. What many people don't know about the Trinity, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, is that each person within the Trinity, even though they are completely equal in value and importance, each one of them had a different role within that relationship. And in particular, as it pertains to salvation. The plan of salvation, the one who stood behind the plan of salvation, who orchestrated everything, who gave the commands, was God the Father. The Holy Spirit was the one who worked to bring it about, to open up our eyes, to make us see our sinfulness, and to make us see our need for a Savior, and to bring us to that point where we say, I need to leave this life, and I need to follow Christ. The Holy Spirit is the one who works in our life, making us new creatures, bringing about the new birth. And of course, all of that is possible only because of Jesus Christ on the cross. All three members of that trinity have their own roles in salvation. And Peter acknowledges this here. And he tells them that God foreknew their salvation, which meant that God also foreknew the effects of their salvation, that suffering would come from it. God foreknew the trouble as well that your salvation would bring you. He understood how your love and your obedience to Christ would make you strange would make you an outcast. How your love for Christ could drive a wedge in your marriage, could drive a wedge in your relationship with your parents, even your children, extended families. He understood how his call upon your life 
would be a struggle for you as all the other people in this life are seeking the joys and thrills of this world, living to just build larger and more lavish lifestyles, living for popularity, fame, and wealth. He understood how you living, how you choosing to live a more content, quaint, disciplined life would make it hard for you to mix and fit in to society. Yet he called each and every one of you anyways. What this means is that Christians might be outcast from society, from society, but God has chosen us and placed us here to be his people. All right, verse 2, according to the foreknowledge of God the Father, in the sanctification of the Spirit. All right, this salvation that had exiled them even within their own land is still at work as the Spirit is sanctifying them. Sanctification is one of those $5 theological words that just means this, the process of becoming more holy. When you get saved, yes, you are immediately holy as it pertains uh, to your position. You are no longer viewed as a sinner. You are a saint. But practically, you still have a whole bunch of sin. And so positionally, you're righteous. Practically, you're sinful. And sanctification is the process of putting away that sin and hopefully becoming more holy and more righteous till you get to heaven. And so you may be exiled, cast out of your homes, but God's not done with you. The Holy Spirit is still at work in your life, sanctifying you, making you more like Jesus. He continues, and he says, for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with his blood. We were saved so that we would be obedient to Jesus. Not just that we would be saved from hell, but that when we were sprinkled by the blood of Jesus and given new life, it brings new life to us. It's where we are different people. And he ends verse 2 by saying, may grace and peace be multiplied to you. Now that's the last thing before he really gets into the meat of this. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. And so it's interesting. He ends chapter 5, verse 12. Chapter 5, verse 12. He ends this. He mentions his kind of his secretary, really the word is amanuensis, the one who wrote for him. He says, By Silvanus, a faithful brother as I regard him, I have written briefly to you, exhorting and declaring that this is the true grace of God. Stand firm in it. He begins by saying, may grace be multiplied to you. He ends by saying, this is the real, this is the true grace. All of this about suffering is bookended with the grace of God. Stand firm in it. At the beginning, it says, I want you to know grace. At the end, after having spent five chapters explaining grace, he says, stand firm. Now that you know it, stand firm. Now, if you have an outline, on the back of that outline, I've got an outline for First Peter. There's an outline on the back of your outline, all right? And you just quickly run through this. As we think about the grace of God being on display in this book, the grace of God is going to look vastly different than what you're going to hear from Joel Osteen and all these other TV preachers. But remember, Peter says this is the true grace of God. In chapter 1, verse 3 through chapter 2, verse 10, this is that beginning section that I told you where Peter teaches on salvation and how that salvation brings us hope in this life. And there's a number of different themes going on throughout this section. There's a theme of good news and grace being given to us. In chapter 1, verse 12, he says, It was revealed to the prophets that they were serving not themselves but you in the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. Verse 13, he says, Set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. Verse 25, And this is the good news that was preached to you. So in this life, the gospel, the good news, is given to you. In light of that, there is a theme of hope Verse 3, remember, this is the people who are suffering, who were exiles, who were losing their lives. He says, according to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope. That's the theme of my sermon next week. Even in the most dire of suffering, we, because of the gospel, we still have a living hope. 
Verse 13, set your hope. There's an intentionality. Set that hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you. Verse 21, because God raised Jesus from the dead and gave him glory, our faith and our hope are in God. He begins good news, hope, faith, purity. Chapter 1, verse 14, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. 15 through 16, be holy. Verse 17, conduct yourselves with fear. Verse 22 and 23, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Now that's something that if you were saved, that should have already been done. And then he finishes up, in light of what's been done, love one another earnestly from that pure heart. Chapter 2, verse 1. So put away all malice and all deceit and hypocrisy and envy and all slander. And then, of course, he ends, this is the true grace of God, stand firm in it. Isn't that the exact opposite of what I mentioned at the very beginning of the sermon about what our response is? We respond in depression and fear and anxiety. Peter says, instead, respond in good news and hope. We respond by just giving up and filled with anger. He says, put all that anger away from you and live in holiness. In light of that, we get to chapter 2, where we get to the transition of verses 11 and 12. Verses 11 and 12 is a call to live obedient, holy lives among the Gentiles. All right? Among the people who are persecuting. You're among the lost world. How are you to live? He spends the rest of the book, chapters 2, 3, 4, and 5, telling us that. Listen to all of these topics that Peter addresses in dealing with wicked people. Verses 13 through 17, submitting to governmental authority. And he specifically mentions wicked government. Government that you disagree with. Verse 18, submitting to evil masters. Maybe wicked authorities at work. Verses 19 through 25, enduring suffering from those authorities and masters. How? By looking to Jesus' example and how he did. Moving on, the same mindset to chapter 3, verses 1 through 6. Being a faithful, gentle, and submissive wife. Even if you live with a husband who rejects the word. Now that'll be a fun sermon when we get there. And we'll get there, believe me, it's coming. But there's a call to submit even if you live with a wicked husband. Chapter 3, verse 7. He flips it to husbands. Being a loving, understanding, and gentle husband, even if your wife rejects the word. Chapter 3, 8 through 12, being a peacemaker and bringing about unity within the church, even when someone is stirring up strife against you. Verses 13 through 22, responding righteously, even when we are wrongly slandered. Chapter 4, 1 through 6, enduring when we are outcast from our group of friends or society because of our faith. 4, 7 through 11, living holy lives that bring glory to God throughout all of the suffering. But even beyond that, verses 12 through 19, getting to the point to where not only do we endure it, but we rejoice in our suffering. Chapter 5, 1 through 5, difficulties and disagreements happen in the church, right? Well, chapter 5, 1 through 5, he writes to pastors and then those who are under pastors about how their relationship is supposed to look and how pastor, shepherd, and the church follows. Chapter 5, 6 through 11 is about all of us resisting the attacks of Satan. And then when he gets to chapter 5, verse 12, he says this is the true grace of God. That. And honestly, when we look at it, this is more real than what Joel Osteen has given his church. That if you just love Jesus, life will go well with you. Because what you and I know is no matter how much you love Jesus, difficulty will come. Trouble will hit. And the Joel Osteen theology eventually craters. But Peter says, this is theology that you can stand firm on. Even when your husband is being a bomb of a husband, how can you rejoice? Even when your wife rejects you, how can you rejoice? Even when people in the church slander you, how can you rejoice? Even when nobody at school wants to be your friend because you're the weird one who wants to obey instead of partaking of sin, how can you rejoice? 
That gets us through life. That's practical. That's applicable. That's the life that we live in. Right? That's the true grace of God. And Peter's given us a whole book that we can consume and live in and make our life. And for the first, for the next, I should say, who knows, eight, nine months, we're going to be here digesting it, going through it. And I hope you're here with me. And I hope you invite people to come who need this as much as you. All right? Y'all pray with me. Father, we're so grateful for Christ. We're grateful for grace. Without Christ, there's nothing. And so, Father, we thank you. And I thank you that you didn't merely just give us Jesus and then just leave us alone, but you gave us a book to guide us through these difficulties. And, Father, I thank you for that. And as we dive into this book, Lord, I pray that you would use it to stir us up towards greater godliness, towards love and good works and holiness. Lord, that that would be what Camellia is known about. When people hear about Camellia Baptist Church, that is a church that loves Jesus and is committed to the word. That is a church that walks what they talk. Lord, may that be what Camellia is known for. And use this book, use your word to get us to that point. And if there is somebody today who needs Jesus as their Lord and Savior, Lord, I pray that you would call them today, right now, this very second. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You guys can stand as we enter into our time of invitation. If you need Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior today, I pray that you wouldn't wait any longer. That today would be that day. That you would come right now and say, I need Jesus. If that's the decision, then you come. The altar's here for prayer. I'm here for prayer as well. Whatever your decision, you come. to be in the house of God with the people of God. So I praise the Lord for all of you. One quick announcement. Uh, James McLean, I know it's been a number of years since he's been healthy enough to be here, but James passed away uh, later on this week. His funeral uh, will be here today at 2 o'clock. Brother Glenn will be leading that. And so I think it's going to open up around 1 o'clock. Uh, we're going to have everything here. So if you want to come to that, uh, one thing is masks are required. And uh, if you want to be a part of that, also Anita will be dropping food off to the family. She will be here as well in the CLC if you want to drop food off uh, for that. All right, so tonight, 4 o'clock Children's Choir, 5 o'clock Awana, 5.30 Building Marriage is God's Way, 6 o'clock the Discipleship Class that's working through the book of Jeremiah. I hope you can be a part of some of that. All right, we, we'd love to have you. All right, and we will end our time of prayer. Thank you. I'd just like to say, Pastor, we're right on. Thank you, Joe.
And our thought is with everything that the pastor spoke about, um, we're to give thanks. And uh, the Psalms tell us, give thanks unto the Lord for he is good. His mercy endures forever. Give thanks unto the God of gods for his mercy endures forever. Give thanks unto the Lord of lords for his mercy endures forever. Let everyone that has breath praise the Lord. So let's all just praise the Lord. Amen? Amen. We're going to close. Find us faithful. Oh, may all.